Hello and welcome to episode five of McTavish Shedcast. Thank you so much for joining us once again. We've had so many of you getting in touch with questions from my guests and I'm just delighted to say that tonight I'm joined by two actors. We've got Jane McGarry, who is best known as playing Isa Drennan in Still Game, and Colin McCready, uh, DC Stuart Fraser, probably best known as in Taggart. Thank you both very much. Lovely to have you joining us and uh, thanks for giving up your evenings. Uh, Colin, how are you coping with lockdown? It's the obvious question, but everybody He's always so nosy to know. Well, actually, it's not too bad because obviously uh, for actors who are, uh, well, they used to be, we, we used to rest, but now we socially isolate. So uh, we've all had a training when we're not working of just being able sitting in the house and watching Netflix. So actually the lockdown's easy for us actors. So uh, I'm actually quite enjoying it. Oh, that's good. And you've got your family with you as well. Yes, I've got a. Uh, obviously, I've got two uh, two girls who are twelve and fourteen. So we're keeping busy. They're doing their schoolwork. Then we do the Joe Wicks exercise class. Then we take the dog out for a walk. Then we'll do baking, cooking, and obviously by about four o'clock, uh, you need to have a drink. So it's great. <laughs> it's like one long holiday. Oh, brilliant, Jane. What are you up to? Well. <laughs> I keep saying I'm going to get up early in the morning and then I never do. It's really, really terrible. I need to turn myself around. And every day I say I'm going to do an exercise video. I've yet to do one. But um, I'm walking the dog. Can you see this shit here? Can you see him? <laughs> hello! Hello, everybody! <laughs> yeah, no, so we have been walking the dog and I've got an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old. So trying to get the 18 year olds not bad. Trying to get the 15-year-old up. That's not easy. Um, and I've been looking after my mum because she's got carers four times a day. So I've been doing lunch times and dinner times. So to be honest, by the time we got up, we got organised. I do everything in the house. I get the kids up, something to eat for them. Go down to my mum's. I'm there for a few hours. Walk the dog for an hour. Come back. Make something for the boys. Go back to mum's. Come back. That's me. It's wine time again. The day's <laughs> done. It's great. Well, uh, well if we mom. just... You might need to cut back on the wine because I can I say that Sharon Gibb is watching you, Jane. Uh, your your personal Ooh. trainer. <laughs> He's not. I don't have a personal trainer, but I do. I love Sharon, and uh, I <laughs> I've gone to Sharon for her classes for years. So hello, Sharon. You're brilliant. You know that I am heart lazy, and what a struggle it will be for me to exercise at all. But I'm going to try my very best for you, Sharon. In fact, tomorrow I promise. I'll do the class online. Oh, well, you heard it here first. Colin, what were you up to before we went into lockdown? What were you working on? Uh, well, I'd been doing, up until Christmas, I was doing, a, I was playing Scrooge in A Christmas Carol in Pilocri. And obviously I'm too young, too nice and too generous to play that part. <laughs> But obviously it was a big acting role for me. Uh, so that finished and then sort of January, February was quiet, but I had a few auditions uh, for a, a film and a series. And the, the irony of it was that you had to, you know, I was doing these self tapes that you do now and both the jobs I knew uh, weren't gonna happen because of the lockdown. So you were actually having to audition for a job that was never going to happen. But hopefully, you know, they might happen maybe in the autumn or late summer. So you never know, you might get something out of them down the line. Uh, well, we've just got some hellos um, coming in from Sh Shirley Mullen and Leslie Roy are watching both of you. Antonia Gota, uh, Susan Ingram as well, and Margaret Hughes. Um, happy Easter, says Shirley to everybody. And uh, Sharon Gibbs says, get back to Zumba. I miss your snake hits, Jane. Uh, Isab Isab Isabel Rutter also watching. Colin, let's go back to this audition process because you said um, you were sending off tapes. Talk us through how, how you do it. Do you have to learn the lines for an audition or can you just... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like this, that you can either do it on your phone or on an iPad and basically you maybe get four or five scenes and you normally get them the night before and then you have to try and learn the lines overnight and then you have to set up and film each individual scene. Then you have to put it onto WeTransfer, send it to your agent, who then sends it to the casting director who maybe sends it to America. or to. So it saves you having to maybe go to London and spend money doing that but it's quite an awkward, time-consuming job. And then you go through all this and you never hear a yes or a no. So you well, don't even know if they ever watch them. Jane, how, how, Sorry, are, your, was... how are your audition no, processes been? 
Well, I bet I did the same one that called for the same Netflix thing that's never going to happen. And uh, I got a message on WeTransfer to say the file has never been opened. So there you go, Colin. They, nobody's even looked at them. They're in a bin somewhere. <laughs> So, okay. so how have you found doing the remote the remote filming then, Jane? Does it always work out for you? We've, we've seen your dog wanting to get in on the act here. No, well, I've got a cat here just sitting right there and I've got the dog here. And uh, to be honest, it's a mate, I have told the kids to be quiet for half an hour, but that doesn't usually work out. So one of them will burst in in a minute. But uh, one that I did last year, uh, I was getting somebody to film and we'd done it over and over and over and it, I, I was I forgetting the line or it wasn't right or the kids would shout or you would hear the Xbox. And then the last time that we did it, I thought, oh, that was quite good. And then just at the end, the cat and the dog had a fight. The cat chased the dog. The dog ran into a table, knocked over <laughs> a vase. <laughs> and you could hear it in the background. And I just thought, ah, that'll do. <laughs> and then I got that job. So that was good. <laughs> Oh, Colin, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you're a classically trained actor, aren't you? What You were, uh, you started your career at youth theatre, like many of us, and then went on to what's known as the Conservatoire. Yes, yes. When I was there, it was just the Academy. Uh, and uh, I always used to joke when, when we filmed Tiger that only, so John, Mickey, Alex and Blythe, none of them had ever been to drama school. So the joke was always that I was the classically trained turn. Uh, so, but yeah, Jane's classically trained as well. Where did you train Jane? I went to Queen Margaret College in Edinburgh. So that was really good, actually. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's changed now. I don't think, well, there's a guy there, Robin Wilson, and he is fabulous. I used to go to Glasgow Art Centre with Robin, and he is so talented and so brilliant uh, that. Um, but it's a different kind of course now there. But at the time, it was a woman called Lynn Baines and, and a man called Clive Perry. And he ran the Lockery Festival Theatre and he'd worked down south a lot as well. He was a cruel man, but a genius. As these kind of, you know, the, the crossover. And I, I did learn so much from him. I mean, I used to cry with laughter at the things that he would say to me were just so so unkind but because I laughed I actually got on really well with him and then he gave me work afterwards and um, I was working at Putlockery when I got a, a, a TV pilot and it was called Pulp Video and it was only a week's work and I had eight months work at Putlockery and Ford and Greg, uh, Julie Nimmo who Greg then married, there was loads of people, Gavin Mitchell, Oh, tons of people in that show and he said to me at the time I'll let you out your contract because for five days of that pilot that could change your life eight months at the law creates great experience but it's not going to change your life and then we ended up that we could work it in and it was from Pulp Video that then I got still game so you know you never know in life actually and, and his experience did teach him that that could just have been a wee hook there they are <laughs> we I should just say Jane I we it's should just Martin. say that you're talking about your drama teacher is allegedly evil. We can't just say he's evil. It was just allegedly evil to you. I think everybody who knew Clive Perry in the business would say he was a cruel genius. But I, I have to say that I loved him personally. Yeah, I find just repeating it again makes it so much better, Jane. <laughs> he's deep now. It's a shame. But anyway, that's, comes to us all. Comes to us all. <laughs> Yeah, the, the pair of you have been involved in real Scottish institutions and we're not just talking about Taggart and Still Game. Colin, you, you, you've not only been in, in Taggart, you've also been in Take the High Road, River City. What's it like once you get into one of those where everybody knows you? Hey. The thing is, it's uh, obviously I came out of drama school and I got a part in Take the High Road, which was great. I did two episodes and I got to uh, hold up Isabel Blair's store and I was the most unned like <laughs> Ned ever. Uh, so it was great just to get involved in a show like that. And also I then went into River City and I did about 16, 17 episodes of that. So, yeah, it's just good. It's good to do. It's quite nice to have. And then I also did like one episode of Still Games. So it's nice to have these kind of iconic shows in your CV. Uh, mm -hmm. I also did an episode of Dr. Finlay. I was in City Lights. Uh, 
one line in City Lights. Uh, so yeah, it's good to do all these kind of iconic shows, as you say, and to meet all the great actors that are in them. What about you, Jane? Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in. Um, we've had uh, Kim Morley asking us about Granny Murray, uh, which we'll touch on in a little bit, uh, saying that Dr. Juno wobbling on the way to work on the bicycle always used to make them laugh whenever they watched <laughs> Granny Murray. Uh, uh, Andrea McKeekin, what age is Isa? Because sometimes she looks 100 and sometimes 21. So what age was she meant to be? Well, well, in one episode, um, Naveed, they have a party for her and it was her 72th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. Isa, your 72th birthday. So she's 72. Ah, uh, right. And um, we've got a, a, another one, just a statement here from Elizabeth Ellis. Just tell Isa I love her. Uh, oh, thank you. It's going to uh, be a fake. Oh, is the oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> she is a wee mince. She's she's a terrible wee cat. She bullies him all the time. It's a shame. It's a shame. Uh uh, whilst, whilst you sort that out, we've had a, um, a question in from Craig Taggart for you, Colin. He said, how frustrating was that Taggart catchphrase? Uh, well, I think the thing is, if I had a pound for uh, every time someone shouted there's been a murder, I'd have about £3,012 by now. Uh, so, yes, I've heard it a few times. And, of course, I never actually said the line. Uh, I think it was probably said once or twice, but any time that you had to say the M word in Taggart, we would always change it to killing, because you couldn't take yourself seriously by saying murder. So we'd also it would always be, sir, there's been a killing. What about Which is filming? also, also, also on a train once, uh, I was going to through to Edinburgh once, and it was uh, one of the big rugby games, and there was this quite posh Edinburgh man on it with the kind of salmon pink cords, you know, the kind of new town, and mm -hmm. he came up to me and he said, oh, uh, has there been a killing? <laughs> he said, you I, be I bet you must get this all the time. And I went, no, you're the first one, this person that's ever said, has there been a killing? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. How was it filming out and about in Glasgow, though? Was it good fun or did, was it quite difficult to actually get scenes done? No, it was great. The thing about Taggart was that apart from the police station, every scene was on location. So we were always somewhere different. We were in flats, we were in streets, we were in buildings, churches. So every day we were in a different place. And obviously that meant you came across the people of Glasgow who uh, obviously used to like to have a laugh and shout and uh, come up with uh, things to put you off. Well, one of the best scenes we ever did was it was outside Central Station. And we obviously we drove up in the car. I think it was Blythe and John and me jumped out, ran into Central Station to arrest what someone. And obviously we rehearsed it two or three times, then we shot it four or five, so maybe did it ten times. And the whole time there was this wee Glasgow woman just standing watching. She just kept watching and watching. And eventually at the end, when we finished the scene, she came up to us and said, oh, excuse me, excuse me, is this is this Taggart that you're filming? And we went, yes, yes it is. She went, was it a new episode or is it a repeat? <laughs> <laughs> The oh, idea, brilliant. the idea that you would have to film a repeat and go back and refilm it again to show it that again that night—that <laughs> would be therein lies madness. Now, Jane, if we we talk about your character uh, of Isa Drennan, you've been uh, quoted on record as saying that you got your inspiration from some of the old ladies that you met in Rutherglen. Tell us about your inspirational people that you met for that character. Well, so many people when I used to go down to like the Main Street or you would, um, like the family, there was a woman that worked in the shop around the corner, Aunt Agnes, um, my, my own Aunt Agnes Grey and my Auntie Maisie and my Auntie Jean. And, and so I think my mum and dad were older. So and a lot of the people that I was uh, that I was mixing with when I was growing up, they were all an older generation. And I remember at Glasgow Arts Centre, all those years ago, I would have been 16. And I did a play called Politics in the Park. And I was playing a pensioner then. And I remember it was great because I could borrow all the costume and all the clothes off the people in my family and the people round about. So I think being brought up by older parents, that was all kind of set me up to play that part too. 
and I know the boys all feel this, that they, they, a lot of the sort of influences from their characters have come from older people that they've loved and their family and round about their neighbours eh, all through their lives. And I think that does come across that there's a great respect for older people. You're not really taking the mickey out of them. You're, you're wanting to show all the layers and all the colours. And eh, yeah, I think that's, that genuinely is true. I've loved so many older people in my life of that sort of in their 70s generation. Uh -huh. A lot of people would still want to know, though, did you ever end up having a wee, a wee winch with Naveed? I thought you were going to say a wee. I thought you were going to say a cunt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I would get an advert for tenor, but it never happened. Raging that. <laughs> but um, don't we... Yeah, Sanjay and I, I think, so, so we never actually got to kiss, but there was once when we were doing the hydro, and it was the second hydro, and it was on the ship, and we were on the poop deck, so we had to do this bit where we would turn round, and we'd kind of look, and we'd come just closer, closer, and the whole audience would go wild, it was almost, it was electric, we both, it was the best feeling in the whole world, and when, like, when the curtain would come in, we were like, ah, that was amazing, but the curtain stuck. So we were getting closer and closer. We thought we didn't we didn't know what to do because it's like you can't kiss because that's such an important thing in the storyline. They can't ever kiss, but what's stopping us? So I think uh, he did. He gave me a spin and he dipped me, and then we just kind of ducked down and crept off. But yeah, so so we never got a kiss. But uh, I I don't know. I think it would spoil the magic if that ever happened. Uh huh. Uh, what about you, Colin? DC Stuart Fraser. Did you know he was going to be gay when you got given the part? Did you ever get a love interest no, for him? No, actually, yeah, no, actually, the, the first year that I filmed Tiger, uh, I didn't know that the character was going to come out as being gay, which um, when I did find out, I was I, I was slightly annoyed because I think it would have been nice to have known that in advance, just the, how you inform that you play the part. But I think it was a deliberate... Uh, I think the, the producers of Tiger wanted to set up the character just like a normal character, a likable mm -hmm. character, and not make him a, a gay character. And that was the thing with the character in Tiger. Like, it could go a couple of years without there being any mention of him being gay or not. And actually, I think it was quite a positive thing. He was a character who just happened to be gay rather than mm -hmm. a gay character. Uh, so, yeah, I think they just wanted to set up that he was a normal, likable person, and it wasn't really that big an issue. And it only became an issue when it was relevant to the storyline. Did you get to be quite fond of the character? Yeah, I think you would. You obviously knew how you fitted in around the different characters and how you developed and what your role was. Uh, certain things about the character would annoy you, the fact that I was meant to be quite techy and a bit of a know-it-all. So people would ask me questions and then I would have to reel off information and facts and times and places <laughs> and information that was really hard to learn. Uh, so sometimes being a smart aleck isn't so good. Right, let me let me just um, get you up to date with who's watching. It's, you're very popular. Uh, Kate Arthur Scott says, I work in Rutherglen. The main street is great. Last time I was there, I saw someone being led along on a dog lead. Oh, takes all sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Fitzpatrick. I once saw two horses walking down at the pavement on their own in the main street at two o'clock in the morning. Two horses just having a walk, looking in the shop windows. Bizarre. <laughs> and I wasn't that, even that. That's brilliant. Uh, Andrew Fitzpatrick says, Jane, you must have been in makeup for hours. To be honest, you look fab. Uh, Monica <laughs> Watson is watching. Uh, Stuart Churchill is watching. And Susan says she's loving hearing from the fab guests and their great stories. Now, Colin, you have also worked uh, with some other huge names. Mickey Rooney being one of them. Yes. Yeah, it was a, works maybe too loose a phrase. It was a, it was about 20, probably about 25 years ago, Mickey Rooney came over to do a Shakespeare workshop uh, for, for a thing that was called the Scottish Actors Studio. And we did it in the BBC and they sort of filmed some of it. And uh, he, Mickey Rooney had played Puck in the 1935 mm -hmm. Midsummer Night's Dream. So mm -hmm. he was coming over to work with all these uh, Scottish actors, with people like Tony Roper were doing it as well. And basically we would do our bit of Shakespeare and then he would give us a masterclass and feedback. But it actually turned out he didn't really know much about Shakespeare. So you would do your speech and he would go, oh, you actors, you Scottish, you're so good. 
what more can I say? And then he would just go straight into an anecdote <laughs> about Judy Garland or Ava Gardner. Or... So uh -huh. it was quite amazing to be in his presence and to hear, you know, he didn't really know a lot about Shakespeare, but his stories were fantastic. And it really was amazing to have that connection and to meet someone who was really from the golden age of Hollywood. That's, that's incredible. Andrea Bateson says, Colin, you are an absolutely brilliant actor. You can tell you are the only one classically trained. I'm sure she's very fond of ah. all the other actors that you worked with, but she obviously yes. singling you out for acting award. And uh, John, John Devaney, loving this. It's a great way to keep us entertained. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine Donnelly, loving the show tonight. Now, a big part of both of your lives has been working on CBeebies as well. Colin, for you, it took up uh, three members of well, four members of your family, if you include your sister-in-law, and Jane. Yes. you were best known as Granny Murray in the phrase that we do, seem so out of date <laughs> now to <laughs> use it for <laughs> me too. A lot. <laughs> oh dear, doctor. Do you know what my favourite thing? That's plenty with the me too picture. Thank you, Yuri. And <laughs> Um, do you know the things that Granny Murray used to say? And oh, I mean, it was just—it was always so random, and it was a great program to work on. Lovely, lovely people made it. Um, I mean, you know them, Colin as well. They're just wonderful. It was the same people that made Colin's show as well. And uh, and she would say things like, um, "Where there's one, there's usually another." And I still say that all the time if I'm looking for a sock, and I say it to the boys. <laughs> and she used to say as well, uh, "What was it? Show it off." pick it up and show it off. I mean, it was just, nothing ever really made sense. And we had this whole story that um, she had her husband, he'd, she'd murdered him and buried him under the patio and everything. There was like a whole backstory <laughs> to me. And when we were filming it, it was next door to the Rose, Rose Royce plant in Hillington and they were taking down the plant. So there used to be rats at the back door. So I used to say to the kids, like on a Monday morning, the rat catcher would come and there was a big sticky mat full of dead rats. And I'd go to the children, <laughs> Come with Granny Murray, my darlings. Come round here. Don't, don't look out the window. Don't don't look out the back window, my darlings. Come to me, my love. Now, come look at this way here. <laughs> and a rat catch would come and take the ball. And sometimes you'd be filming and a rat would be at the back door looking in, seeing what we were doing because we were always chopping up fruit and everything. So it was, um, it was, it was great fun. And we used to laugh Mickey, Mickey John, who was Welsh, who was from Brother Glenn, whose name's Donald. And he writes with Sanji, Fags, Bags and Mags. And uh, we did an episode where he had to guess my weight and he had to lift me. And honestly, <laughs> I, I, like the, the people were getting really annoyed because it was like maybe half an hour. We were just laughing, laughing. He picked me up, would collapse in the chair. We'll do it, promise we'll do it this time, this time we'll do it. But we laughed till we cried making that programme. It was really good fun. And Colin, tell us about Woolly and Tig and, and how you all got involved in it, the whole McCready family. Yeah, well, it was the people, uh, Helen and Brian, that made me too as well, and they also made Balamori. So I was actually, my kids at that point went to the Scottish Youth Theatre, and I was away at my friend Tony's wedding in LA, which was very nice. And my wife ended up, without my knowledge, taking the girls for an audition. And I think it was Maisie, the older one, who they thought, but she they thought she was too old. And Betsy at that point was three and a half, and she was a, re a wee character. Uh -huh. So they really liked Betsy. And then they worked out that Maisie could be the voice of her looking back. And then they found out that I was their dad. So their dad was an actor. And then once we did one episode, they were looking, once they got commissioned, they needed a mother. And my sister-in-law, Jenny uh, Ryan's an actress. So she played the mum. So it was a complete family affair. Uh, and my sister did some props on it. And my niece was in it as well. And uh, the best thing about it was because Betsy was so young was to try and get people that Betsy knew. So mm -hmm. we got Alex Norton to play her uh, grandfather. So it was good. Yeah, it was a real family affair and lots of people that we, we knew. And uh, they still show it all the time. And it was quite good. So for a change, instead of people shouting at me, me there's been a murder, they would shout, it's only a toy spider. <laughs> so that's what certain people <laughs> Not quite as me. catchy. <laughs> no. But you were topless in it as well. Yes, there was a scene Ooh, which, uh, Colin. which is, a, which is a, about going on a swimming lesson. So the, the, the William Tig was all about a little girl overcoming her fears and the spider would come to life and sort of reassure her and explain things. So this episode was about, a, it was called Splash, about going to a swimming lesson. 
and obviously I had to go in the pool with my uh, speedos on. And uh, apparently on YouTube, it's been watched over. I think at the moment, the, the, the episode's up at the moment. It's like 103 million uh, views, and apparently in total, <laughs> it's been watched over 200 million of me with my top off. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So let's move on to your love of theatre because the pair of you have done so much theatre work as well. Jane, you've got, uh, you've done lots of panto, but you've got a big production coming up, fingers crossed, in September, haven't you? Yes, I have with uh, Mark Cox and Paul Riley. So we, we always wanted to sort of give something back to people because they've been so positive and so warm and doing still game was just an amazing sort of experience for 20 years. What we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to tour the, the show around all over Scotland and say to folk, you sit where you are and we'll come to you. And when we can, we're going to ask the other members like Sanj and Gav. I speak to them a lot as well, and you know, and obviously Ford and Greg too, and and different people who've been in the show, Peggy, uh, Stevie the Bookie, loads of folk uh, who've played a big part and you know, Paul Young, eh, we're going to ask them to come on as guests and be part of it. It's just impossible to have everybody doing it all the time. So that's why we thought we'll do it as the three of us. And you know, like Gas was doing other work as well and Sanchez in River City. It's impossible to tie everybody down to the whole tour. But mm -hmm. um, so, and we've been, we've been lifelong friends. Like, same with Colin you and I, we've been friends for many, many years and we've worked together in loads of shows, to, eh, haven't we Colin? We've laughed many times and we laughed and we've cried. Uh, and been oh, terrible, even on stage we've laughed over our behaviours being poor. But, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, Paul and Mark and myself, we're really, really close friends. So we want to go and just do that, drive about, have a carry on and, and, and do the show and give something back. Well, tell us what it's called. Still gone. But of course it might not be gone with the virus, but we're, 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 I think we should call it now, God willing, still gone. <laughs> But you've you've already <laughs> tested out the audiences, haven't you, in Greenock? Is that right? No, we were going to do one in June, but we've had to move that to August because of the virus. And you know, hopefully, hopefully it will go ahead. It's really, really difficult because I genuinely believe that theatres and big spaces like that, big busy pubs, that'll be the they'll be the last places mm -hmm. to open. So you know, if you're if you're playing to the Kings or or, or something, and there's maybe twelve hundred people. I don't know. I don't know if they'll maybe say that'll be next year before those venues will open. We really don't know at the moment. But I think, we'll, what would you say, Colin? Probably by end of June, we'll all have a, a better idea. Yeah, I think there maybe they might open smaller theatres first and then maybe bigger venues. And, you know, I just don't think anyone knows, you know, whether, whether the Kings and the theatres like that, when they'll get back open. But fingers crossed they, they do, because it's work mm -hmm. for not only the actors, but all the the crew and stage yeah. management and the people in the box office. So we really need these buildings open. Yeah, earlier you were talking about Pit Lockery and the, the theatre there, it's just integral to the the whole existence of the town, isn't it? Yeah, well, as I say, I, Jane's, Jane's worked there before and I was working there at Christmas and it's they've had to cancel their whole summer season of six shows. So instead of doing it this year, they're going to do it next year because a place like Pit Lockery, it's so... It's not just about putting the plays on, it's about having an audience. And Pitlockery relies so much on tourists and people coming for the day and on holidays that there's no point putting the plays on if no one's coming to visit. So just fingers crossed that um, they can get back open and people will come back again. Uh, let me just uh, bring in a few of the people who are watching. Uh, Una Walker's watching. She says uh, her a Glaswegian son who lives in Brighton is often asked to say there's been a murder all the time down there. Angela Angela Robertson and Betty uh, Brands are watching. Sue Glenn, what a laugh. Three Scottish legends. I'm very honoured that you've classed me as a Scottish legend, Sue, but I'm not in the same league as these two. Doreen Robertson, it's great to have a laugh. Jackie Bird, it's uh, making her ironing uh, go a little bit faster. Doreen uh, <laughs> uh, Feckley, met Jane and Colin at the Invercars Hotel in Dundee a few years ago and plonked myself in between Jane and Mark for a carry-on. Lovely people. Uh, yeah, we did. We had a great time there, actually. 
um, uh, it's a lovely guy who's doing a lot of work up in Dundee and I think Mark and I are going to go and do some work with him later in the year as well. We were supposed to be doing it in March and now it's going to be later on but that was great. Colin and I have done burn suppers together haven't we? Uh, we've been in Dunfermline together at the Alhambra quite a few times because Storf and Road Nativity. What else have we done Col? Uh, we did a play pine a pint, uh, Rumpel's oh. we did a panto and we played sister and brother. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy and Bendy Miller. <laughs> it, it, it seems like there's a great camaraderie amongst the, the Scottish acting fraternity. I genuinely believe that there is actually. Um, there's there's loads uh, loads of girls and we all support each other and we've got a kind of WhatsApp group and if anybody needs help with a, a self-tape because often you've got to get somebody to read in um, and not just, it's mostly women that's on it, but there's some guys as well. And, you know, everybody's really positive at trying to help each other. And either you're going to get a job or you're not going to get it. But there's no point, you know, trying to hold somebody else back. So if it's not right for me, that's great. If Sally Reid gets it or Julie Nimmo or whoever. Uh, so, no, we are all quite supportive of each other. They're, they're lovely girls and hugely talented as well. Because when I thought about putting the two of you together on this shedcast, I didn't realise you were such close friends. Yeah, we've been close friends for years, Colin, haven't we? I love that wee yes. face. <laughs> I, I, know all Jane, I know all Jane's secrets. Oh, he knows them all, he knows them all. And often uh, we would we would uh, like sh we would drive to jobs together, so we would spend lot. We would pick each other up and get all our, all the gossip and all the <laughs> chat. And Jane would always be late. And oh, yeah, yeah. We used to meet in Jesse Street, didn't we? At Pomody. <laughs> we were always meeting Jesse. I just thought oh, that the glamour. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right beside the dump. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly where you're meaning. Uh, so, what's coming up in future then, Colin? You've been working on a film, haven't you? Yeah, just before, just at the end of last year, it's a film called The Last Bus, and it was directed by Gillis McKinnon who I'd worked with 20 odd years ago in a film called Small Faces. And it's a film that stars Timothy Spall and Phyllis Logan. And it's about an old man in his eighties who's trying to get from John O'Groats to Land's End on his free bus pass. And it's quite a gentle, sad, but funny film. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, throughout the film, uh, Timothy Spall meets lots of different characters who get on and off the different buses. So I was in, I had a nice wee three or four scenes with Tim I was playing like a posh landowner type with the sort of salmon pink cords and the barber jacket whose Land Rover crashes at the side of the road and has to get onto the slummit by getting on the bus. So yeah, it's a lovely script and uh, I did a bit of dubbing on that just the week before the lockdown so I saw a little bit of uh, how it was looking and it looked great. So hopefully that'll be coming out later on in the year. Uh, it was lovely to work with Timothy Spall, he was a lovely guy and he's just a great actor as well. And Jane, you've got um, your theatre tour coming up, but presumably you just don't know if there's going to be panto for you this year because that's normally one of your regular gigs, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Mark and I are doing panto again at uh, the Beacon, which we love. We love all the, the crew and all, you know, it's always a great cast and, uh, and, and all the staff that work in the theatre. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I would really hope so. I would be, I think all actors will be pretty devastated if by Christmas we still can't work in theatre. So, fingers crossed, yes. Oh, well, lovely. Uh, let me just uh, round up. The last few people are watching. Uh, Andrea Bateson says, uh, that sounds like a great film, Colin. Kay Blair, hello, thanks for watching. Janet McDonald, what a laugh. It's made my night, brilliant. Uh, Jean McCready says, hi, Colin. Is that a relative of yours, Colin? My sister. Your sister. Hello, hi, to Colin. hi to Colin's <laughs> sister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, Lynn Kennedy as well, um, Monica watching and Lorraine Donnelly says, Jane Isa is a brilliant character. My husband has affectionately nicknamed my sister Isa as she's just a bit nosy. We all call her uh, this now. Well, that's nice. Uh, well, hello to everybody. Thank you for watching. Oh, well, thank you both for joining us very much. Now, in the style of Granny Murray, you always ended the show with a little kernel of advice, didn't you? Like a sort of a Jerry Springer. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your, what's your advice for keeping going through the lockdown? What would Granny Murray say? Granny Murray would say, 
Uh, oh, it would be so random what she would say. It would be no use to anybody. If Granny, <laughs> if Granny were to be something like, remember, always pickle an egg. <laughs> That's what it would be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and on that note, Colin and Jane, thank you both very much for joining us for our Shedcast. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.